What's up, Internet? It's your boy, Aaron. Welcome to Gold Hall Gaming. That's right. We are here today to start a new segment that's been being talked about for like the last three weeks. Uh, yeah, we're finally getting started. Um, solo plays. I've got my hands on a lot of uh, single player campaigns, <laughs> uh, campaign modules or D&D 5th edition, that some of them are pretty interesting, some of them are pretty cool, some of them are very entertaining. And that's what we're going to be starting here today, um, supplied by one of our uh, com uh, community zone members. Um, we have Wolves of Langston. This is a 5e uh, module created by Obvious Mimic. Um, and they have done a phenomenal job, in my opinion, of making a choose-your-own-adventure style um, playthrough system here. So, with that being said, um, things are going to be a little bit weird, going to be a little bit different uh, than what y'all are used to from a D&D &D tabletop stream here on this channel. Um, yeah, I've made it, uh, we have, I have already gone ahead and created my character. I am now launching, uh, as a player so that I can, uh, prepare myself. Oh shit, I gotta exit, re-enter as GM, my B. Rejoin as GM. Fucked up something. There we go. All right, the problem has been fixed. Switch this back over to player only mode. Hello, Nero. Are you here to join us for the shenanery today? You are, you wanna jump up behind me? All right, come on. <clears throat> Come on. Take a seat. I said take a seat. Nero. <laughs> what are you doing, son? Oh, shit. Your tail is knocking the fuck out of the microphone, sir. You want to turn around? Like, like, give me your head over here. Give me your head up here. Okay. There we go. Are, are you, are you happy? Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you happy now? You are, you are. Hold on. You guys got, you guys got to see this nonsense, y'all. Y'all, y'all got to see this nonsense. Hold on a second, guys. Oh Lord, hold on. I don't know how that got all the way up there, but. I have a lap dog, the Nero. He has recently learned that he can jump up here and be a pain in my ass. Isn't that right, big baby? You happy? You happy where you at? Are you, are you are you far enough up my ass now? Okay. So, like I was saying, um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started here. Um, as you can see, we I have uh a roll twenty game. God damn it! I. <sighs> and that moment when you re when I realized y'all can't actually see anything yet. So give me a second. There we go. 
All right. Let's go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes. So we are running, I am running Kragen through this. Um, this is a significantly gimper version of Kragen though. Um, obviously we are min-maxed for, uh, for the build. But apart from that, we are only level two. No real power moves going on here, um, except for charging expertise because yeah. Y'all, y'all, y'all find out about that soon enough. Um, ain't got no spells, ain't got no bio. All right, we are just a far traveler. That's all we are. We got languages. We also have talents. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. I'm a liar. Wrong character. But anyways, that is Kragen. We are running through this. Ow. Ow. What's up? What's up? What? What's up, my baby love? You ready to start? Yeah, you ready to get started? Okay. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, story time. Chapter one. After a long day on the road, you crest a hill and see the lights of a town. According to maps and helpful locals you've consulted, this must be Langston. Though the last blush of sunset still colors the sky to the west, lamplight is already visible at the gate and in the streets. In the dim twilight, you can clearly see that the dirt road you've been traveling transitions to cobblestones, and a simple stone wall rings the town. Even from this distance, you can see the timber-framed walls of the buildings in town are well-maintained with fresh whitewash that glow golden in the lamplight. It's a beautiful little town, a prosperous trading hub nestled among the fertile farmland and old-growth forest you've spent the last few days traversing. The stars are just starting to emerge as the lone howl of a wolf splits the silence off somewhere in the woods. A, cor a chorus of responding howls take up the call, some uncomfortably close, and getting closer. You pick up your pace to put more distance between you and the wilderness in the hope of a soft bed, a hot meal, and some work for an enterprising adventurer. A town as prosperous as Langston looks like a place to do good, earn coin, and achieve glory. Maybe all three at once, so long as you aren't eaten by the wolves here and there. Ugh. 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 Are you, are you, what, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do, Nero? <laughs> All right, so this is our first perception check we are making here. Um, let's go ahead and make that perception check. That is a 19. Yeah, we definitely made that. So, we will be going to page 23. Or prop 23. Going to keep a record going here of exactly which prompts and where we go from here. That way we, we can kind of plot out the overall story going on you hear something in the woods off to one side and spin in that direction a pair of golden yellow eyes peers out of the dark underbrush soon joined by a second pair turning around you see more eyes gathering in the gloom around you before you even consider it as an option a shaggy dark gray wolf steps out onto the path behind you Hopelessly outnumbered, you can either square up to fight the pack of wolves, 
or sprint for the town. What are we gonna do, Nero? What are we gonna do? Huh? What are we gonna do? We gonna fight the wolves? Or are we gonna run from them like a bunch of bitches? We fight? I'm asking you. You wanna fight them? Or run away? You wanna fight? Okay. We gonna fight them, guys! So, we're going to go to prompt 33. You square up to defend yourself as the pack of hungry wolves start to circle, looking for an opening to attack. There are at least 10 of them. And something tells you more awaiting in the darkness of the tree. It looks like an early end to your adventure and career, but you're determined not to give up without a fight. You're just about to unleash your attack and go down fighting when you hear a bellow behind you down the, on the road. You turn around to see a bald dwarf dressed in rough spun clothes and animal hides, pointing at you from on top of a rise in the road, or maybe past you. Moonlight shines off the skin of his head. His face is lit by small balls of fire dancing in the air over his outstretched palms. Oh no you don't! He yells, the flames flaring with his emotions. Get back, you lot! The wolves immediately tuck their tails between their legs and lay their ears down flat. The apparent leader looks at you and whines. Not a chance, the dwarf scoffs. Gone now. The wolves slink quietly back into the woods, and you realize you are still poised to attack. The dwarf doesn't seem to notice as he approaches you. And he eyes you up and down. The silence between you stretches until it breaks with a massive sneeze. Sorry, you all right? He asks with a lopsided smile and a sniffle. Uh, didn't have a chance to get a piece off you, did they? You let him know that you're all in one piece and thank him for his intervention. Oh, Nero is a leaving to go do whatever the Nero does. And we are going to prompt four. Well then, lucky for you, I was here, he says with a wide grin and a slap on the back hard enough to throw you off balance, throw off your balance. He opens his mouth to speak again, but nothing comes out until he unleashes a sneeze that makes his beard bristle. You wait for him to regain his composure. You must be hungry then. Go straight down this road and you'll reach the town of Langston. Find the pickled hen, and if anyone asks, tell them Roy Sunderhammer sent you. You stammer out a thank you, despite the adrenaline coursing through you. Think nothing of it. Uh, <laughs> think nothing of it. I am on my way there myself. Funeral, you see, doing my druidic duty to the circle of life and all that. He got, he got, uh, guffaws at. God damn it, fucking English, man. He guffaws as he. As if he just told a joke. But before I do that, I'm going to have a bit of a chat with these naughty pups. They should know better. Before you have a chance to respond, the dwarf lops off toward the woods. With a surprisingly graceful gait, given his stocky build. Between the darkness and another night on the road or a hot meal and a soft mattress, it's hardly even a decision to head toward the lights of Langston. And now we go to prompt one.
Your hopes for a meal and friendly conversation are dashed with what you find in the marketplace. More specifically, you're disappointed with what you don't find. It's empty, filled only with a mournful hush. Street vendors are closed, windows are shuttered, lamplighters have still passed uh, through to light the square with warm pools of light. But everything feels muted under the weight of an oppressive sadness. You're looking around for someone, anyone, when a solitary figure in a white robe bustles out from a side street, nearly dropping a sheaf of papers. The robes, uh, the robes hood is down, so you can't, so you can see that it's a young human woman with blonde hair. Her robes bear sunburst motifs around the neck and collar, and a similar symbol made of gold hangs from around her neck. It appears to be a sun glare. Ah. So we can call out to the cleric, or we can follow her down the empty street. I'm a roll percentile on it. High, I call out. Low, I follow. All right, I call out. That takes me to... Prompt 27. The cleric jolts and turns, and you see a moment of fear as her hand reflective, uh, reflexively snaps to her holy symbol. She looks either way down empty streets before breaking out into a wide, kind smile as she approaches. Hello and welcome, she says, her voice high and bright. Can I help you with something, traveler? You ask her where she's going in such a hurry. I'm on my way to perform a young woman's last rites, she says, her kind su a smile still fixed to her lips. Such a sad day. You ask if she is on her way to the pickled hen. I am, she says with growing uncertainty. Did you, did you know the deceased? You say that you do not, but someone named Roy suggested you go to the pickled hen for lodging. Ah, of course, she says with a sigh. A truly good dwarf, Roy. The funeral will be starting soon and I must be on my way, but I can show you the way if you'd like. She walks beside you in silence, occasionally consulting the sheets in her hand and reading it to herself. After a few moments of awkwardly accompanying the young cleric, she shows you to an inn whose sign says it's the pickled hen. The cleric absent-mindedly opens the door and steps into the tavern at the ground floor. Having clearly forgotten you're even there, she closes it behind her. So, now we can either just go ahead and go right in, or look through the window. Hmm. Yep, looks like I'm just busting in there. So we're going to be going to prompt 34. The tavern is nearly full to capacity of townspeople milling about speaking quietly to one another. The hums lacks the boisterous outburst of laughter and shouts or, or shouts you normally associate with taverns this crowded. And the answer quickly becomes apparent why. I forgot about something. Give me a second, guys. Okay, I gotta go back in as GM. Okay, so might as well just stay in GM mode. It'll be significantly easier for me, apparently.
There we go, some ambiance going on there. Believe it or not, this is actually another part of the DM Tools for um, Wolves of Langston. So, at one end of the common room, there's a closed casket on a table amidst what looks like hundreds of flower arrangements. A musician is strumming a lyre in a sad tune off in the corner. As you are looking around, an older man is arguing with a huge half-orc woman with an impressive collection of battle scars and a suit tailored in a typical nobleman's style. Seeing you, the man grimaces and sways over to you. He reeks of ale and spirits and his face sags and him Habitual sadness, but his eyes glitter with both tears and an unexpected rage. I don't know you, he slurs, stabbing a blunt finger in the air between you. Was it you? Did you do this? What else have you done? Few heads nearby turn as he throws his hands up into a fighting stance and starts bobbing unsteadily. The half-orc crosses her arms and watches the both of you carefully. You're at a funeral in a strange town, so violence is not an option. You can try to persuade him to leave you alone or intimidate him into backing down. Okay, so do we want to piss off the town, or do we want to try to handle this proper? Uh, it's Kragen we're talking about here. And while I might enjoy acting like I don't understand other cultures and their traditions, I'm actually not that ignorant. And this is a funeral. I think we're going to go with the leave him, leave me alone. And go to prompt 41. You raise your open hands and assure the man calmly that there has to be some kind of mistake. There's no need to fight, and certainly no need to ruin such a somber event. Roll a per, 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 a roll of charisma. Uh, roll a charisma persuasion check if you get a twelve or more. Go to pay. Go to prompt two if you get under twelve. Go to thirty six. Oh great, Kragen Stumpstead coming in like a failure here. Uh, persuasion. Yep, we failed. So we will be going to prompt 36. Don't you dare take that tone with me, vagabond. He snarls and takes a swing, but the blow is intercepted by the green-skinned hand of the half-orc in the suit. Her large hand is crisscrossed with scars and easily engulfs the man's fist. Enough, she says. Time to go. Yes, yeah, sure, Tanya, he says. I mean... Mayor Anathrum, I mean, bye. The drunk slinks unsteadily out the door and leaves the tavern. You're about to say that you could have handled him on your own when you see the half-orc's hard stare. Go to prompt 44. Shoo.
The female half orc in the tailored suit looks at you, eyes scanning up and down. I am Tanya Anathrum, mayor of Langston. She says with a nod, her common heavily accented with a guttural orcish twang. I may have use of you. Please stay for the funeral. I will speak to you after, I guess is the way that would sound. You try to reply, but she is already walking away as the ceremony begins. Go to Prop 28. A middle-aged human couple gets up and introduces themselves as Maybelline's parents. Though, for the murmur of sympathy coming from the crowd, that seems well known. Thank you so much for coming out to say goodbye to our darling girl with us, the mother says. She was a ray of sunshine in our lives from the beginning. And we can see that she touched the lives of many of you as well. She was relentlessly kind generous and patient we will all miss her dearly the father of the deceased clears his throat his eyes glassy we're <clears throat> we're so very grateful for the people of langston you've made our daughter's life a joy and you're making her loss more bearable but we will not be seeing you for some time A murmur runs through the crowd, but he holds up his hands for quiet. Every brick and blade of the grass in this town reminds us of what we have lost. Every time we see your kind faces, we will only see the torn and broken body of our treasured daughter. So we will leave and trust our capable mayor to bring the killer to justice. We will keep our peace at home, where we feel the closest to our daughter's memories. But we pray you bring the killer to swift justice. As he speaks, heads in the crowd turn to the mayor, who just nods to the citizenry. When you turn your attention to the grieving parents, the father's cheeks are wet with tears, but his teeth are gritted in mute rage. Laying a gentle hand on her husband's arm, the deceased mother speaks up. But we are not the only ones to suffer our loss. She said in a cracking voice, We had Maybelline for her whole life. The love of her life was cheated out of the rest of it. Tomlin, darling, we'd love it if you could say a few words. The parents of the dead woman step aside, and her fiancé takes their place at the podium prom 32 the man identified as tomlin is dressed simply and he clutches a bunch of flowers tightly in one hand he takes a moment looking out over the crowd visibly holding back tears Thank you all for so much. Thank you all so much for coming today. We are gathered to remember the beautiful shining light that was my bride to be. Before growing to love her, I never thought I was the marrying kind. Now it seems more like fate than a choice. Does that mean the wolf is back on the prowl? Whispers one man near you to a friend. Lock up your sisters and daughters. And wives, the friend replies with a snigger. Both are shushed by women who seem to be their wives. Both women sharing embarrassed glances. Others nearby in the crowd look over at the pair of would-be comedians with glares and mouthed insults. My darling wife-to-be was a simple soul, he says. Favorite flowers were daisies. She liked the color lavender. Anything made of silk was the height of sophistication. Despite Tomlin's grief, the two men are still whispering lewdly and sniggering. 
The women seated beside the would-be comedians glared at them and exchanged exacerbated looks with one another. Oblivious to what was happening in front of you, Tomlin closes his eyes to collect himself with a sigh before continuing. To put it simply, Maybelline's death has torn a hole in my heart in my life that cannot be filled. But I will try. Work will help, I'm sure. I'm giving back to all of you who have done so much for me, especially in these dark times. I can only try to repay your kindness. I truly love you all, and you are all welcome at my home at any time. The audience applauds respectfully and murmurs condolences. Right away, however, something seems odd about the situation. You may either use an investigation check or an insight check to determine what's piquing your interest. All right, so obviously uh, we're going to go for that insight check because, yeah, we're, we, we ain't got investigation. So we're going to go to prompt 46. People are behaving oddly, but you're not quite sure what is odd about them. Alright, there is our in- Oh yeah, nat 20 on the inside. That is a 24. Um, if you get 10 or more, go to prop 29. Gain an inspiration! Hell yeah! There we go! Though Tomlin's grief and sadness are almost certainly genuine, there's an element of relief, maybe even excitement from him. And a number of women attending the service whispered amongst each other with genuine, if fleeting, smiles. The angry wives shared embarrassment carry, uh, and the angry wives shared embarrassment carried an undercurrent of something more focused, as if, as if confirming their husband's joke with a secret shared hope that Tomlin really would turn his attention to the bored wives of Langston. Though there are layers of complexity here, you will have to investigate another time as the next speaker is replacing Tomlin. This one is a familiar red-bearded dwarf. Go to thir prompt 13. We are just tearing it up. The dwarf is dressed in hides and homespun cloth while his hair and beard seem struggling to break free from the leather cords he's used to style them. He's clean now, but something in the dwarves demeanor suggests this is his version of dressing up. Welcome, people of Langston, he says with a warm smile that makes his eyes sparkle. As sad as I am to see Maybelline return to the earth, I want to remind Langston to choose life. As you all know, I'm grateful my circle assigned me to Langston. There's a murmur of assent in the crowd and a few raised glasses. And you have all made it so easy for me. You've respected the forest and its inhabitants. And in return, I have been happy to act as both spiritual counsel and guiding hand for the forces of nature around us. I join you in grieving the loss of a wonderful member of this community. And I hope you will all join me in welcoming her back into the circle of life. He mutters a spell as his hands begin to radiate a faint green glow. But he's interrupted by a sneezing fit. After which his beard and hair thicken and stand on end. He smooths his hair and regains his composure. Excuse me, he says with a deep growl in his voice. He clears his throat and completes his spell, 
causing a splash of extraordinarily bright wildflowers to bloom on the dais on which the casket rests. He nods in approval at his own work before turning to the crowd, raising a glass and smiling broadly. To life! He downs his drink along with the others in the crowd, but you're more interested in the strange reaction the local, local druid had to the sneezing fit. You can try either an arcana or perception check to better understand what you've seen. There we go. So, Perception or Arcana. We're going to roll that on Perception. Oh! Prompt 14. You focus your senses on the bushy-haired druid, especially those odd changes that occurred during his sneezing fit. Uh, yeah, going to prompt 10. The druid is behaving oddly, but that could just as easily be explained by the strain of the situation. He seems like a happy, well-adjusted person, but is somehow a little bit off balance. The next speaker in the ceremony is approaching, an unobtrusive young woman, human woman in the vestments of a sun cleric steps up to the crowd to speak. Prompt 39! Is there a Nero right there? Is there a, it, that is a Nero? I just heard. Okay. Though so you met her in the street. Oh shit. Hold on. <clears throat> Though you met her in the street. The young sun cleric seems like a different person behind the podium. She speaks clearer and stands up straighter. She seems possessed of a confidence you didn't get from the same sweet, but a little scattered young woman you met on your way to the pickled hen. Most of you from town know me, but I see some unfamiliar faces, she says. I am Selene, a member of the Radiant Order and custodian of Langston's Eastern Temple. May the light guide you. Several people reflexively respond with, and you. They then make a salutation of the right hand touching the heart, and then moving in an arc overhead, reminding you of a sun rising and setting overhead. Given the cleric's youth, it's obvious her order has a long history in this town. Though we are in the dark shadows cast by our loss, she continues, the sun will for shine forever on Maybelline as her presence was a bright shining light to all of us. I did not know Maybelline well in life, 
but it is clear that she has touched the lives of everyone here in this room. She looks directly at Tomlin and smiles kindly. And my heart goes out to you especially, Tomlin. Know that my door is always open to you. And then she leads the service in a hymn she introduces as coming from the... the uh, but to butcher the fuck out of this. Rathana Kananar, Book of Funerary Rites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems that no one in the audience knows it, but she sings anyway in a high, sweet voice. The crowd labors to keep up with her. As we guard the light with you and drive the shadows away, the radiant sword of your heart, the evils of darkness slay. Even though you're gone from our sight, and our heart of hearts remain, rest well in the light of the sun, and the shield of our faith sustain. Though the cleric appears to be earnest and sincere, the difference between the woman you met outside and the one standing before you now is stark. You may opt to roll either a religion or an insight check. Yeah, we're gonna roll an insight check. Um, 43. All right. The cleric's role as a spiritual leader clashes with the shy demeanor she displayed earlier, so you consider what may actually be motivating her. Make that an insight check. Uh, yeah, I am apparently not a very insightful motherfucker. Go to prompt seven, okay. There is something about the cleric's delivery of her service that makes it feel like she is holding back, but you can't tell what is bo bothering you as she does seem to earnestly care about the community under her charge. The mayor strides up behind Selene for her, right, uh, for her turn to speak, and the cleric notices her with a slight start before seating her spot at the front of the room. Go to prompt 25. And if you guys will give me a minute, I'm going to go grab something to drink real quick. I'll be right back. There's your hug. Bully. Ugh. Ugh. Sorry about that, guys. As Selene recedes into the background, the half-orc mayor stands rigid with her hands clasped behind her back. She cuts a powerful figure with her broad shoulders and battle scars, but she maintains an air of sophistication with a well-made suit in the noble style. 
An enormous mastiff pads up to her side and sits beside her, remaining equally still. Though her heritage stands out to you in the most human town of Langston, no one else seems to notice. Sits Buttercup. I, I I I I can't I can't I can't do a good female orc. I'm sorry, guys. Um, she says to the dog in a heavy accent. The mastiff immediately sits itself at her side. The mayor returns her attention to the crowd of attendees. Tanya Anathrum was a soldier before she was your mayor. She begins laying a hand over her heart. Langston welcomed me. Gave me a place to heal after the Battle of Three Rivers. There I fought to defend the people from a barbarian horde. And I will protect the people of Langston. She looks out into the crowd. Moving just her eyes as the rest of her remains perfectly still. Her huge dog could be a statue for all it moves. There's a killer out there in the darkness, she says, and her eyes lock on yours. We do not know what it is, but it took one of the citizens under my protection. We will find whatever took this life and end the threat. This is my promise to you. A, rip a ripple of soft applause and angry muttering sweeps through the crowd. The dog's head tracks both sounds for a moment before glancing at the mayor returning to its vigil. There's Buttercup, y'all. She, return, she turns to address the family of the deceased. I am so sorry for your loss, she says, and then steps away from the casket and starts making her way through the crowd towards you. As she makes her way to where you're standing, you can make either a history check or an animal handling check. A history check, y'all. Oh, uh. An 11. Okay. Okay. So we're going to be going to prompt 37. You think you remember the events of Tanya's story differently. We got an 11, so we will be going... We, let's double check that. Yep, that's an 11. Um, if you roll a 10 or higher, go to prompt 17. Gain another inspiration. Well, fuck. Womp womp. I can run it as hero points. Nope, nope, nope. We're not, we're not, we're not changing the rules. It actually, uh, one of the big, big things I will let you guys know about this, the way this module is designed, they actually explicitly make it clear. You gotta, you gotta follow this pretty strictly. Otherwise. You're not going to be able to really enjoy it. And as y'all can tell, I've gone full into submitting myself to the module. Woo! All right, so the mayor made some glaring mistakes in her account of the battles she said she participated in. The Battle of Three Rivers was a coup by a neighboring kingdom, not barbarian hordes. And it was won by guerrilla tactics from the local peasantry who were the aggressors, not the victims. But it's unclear if she's, just, if she's lying or just wrong. So this probably isn't the best conversation starter as the mayor approaches. Go to prompt 30.
You're an adventurer, yes? She says to you. Um... Sure, let's go with that one. When you answer in the affirmative, she continues, I suppose you will do for now. Between her rumbling, orcish accent and deadpan delivery, it's impossible to tell what she actually thinks about you. But she does make a sweeping gesture toward the bar and then starts off. This stern woman is obviously not one for pleasantries. As you follow behind her, she stops to speak to an uh, to an prone, balding man. You can only assume is the innkeeper. And the town will pay the investigator's room and board. This is acceptable. The innkeeper cuts you a glance but nods. Their business concluded. Mayor Anathrim returns to you with a key to your room. You ask why she would hire you. I know your type. Adventurer mercenary hero for hire it doesn't matter what you call yourself the people are scared and they need someone so i'm hiring you and since you're an outsider if you fail it will not reflect badly on the town you start to thank her but she cuts you off i do not know do not yet know you she says as she holds up a hand and i may not get time to do so if this killer gets to you next you're here for the people and for me, as long as you're investigating this young woman's murder, we'll pay you for your stay. You will come to the town hall tomorrow, as tonight is not the time to discuss the details of the case. Sleep well. She nods once, though it's unclear whether that's a farewell or an agreement of some kind. And then returns to her duties, reassuring the funeral goers. You remain standing dumbfounded for a moment... As a figure breaks away from the crowd and moves towards you. It's Tomlin, the village herbalist and fiancé of the deceased. Hello, he says. His eyes are almost entrancing up so close. I haven't met you yet. How did you know, Maybelline? You reply that you just arrived in town today, but the mayor has requested your help with the investigation. He looks you over and nods as if you pass some sort of assessment. Welcome, then. Thank you very much for doing this for us. Please, come to my home for whatever you need. I want, no, I need to know what happened to my Maybelline. You bid the grieving man good night, and he gives you a smile that is dazzling despite its sadness. He moves on to speak to the other guests, and you make your way to your room. Go to Prompt 26! Get the benefit of a long rest. I haven't even done anything yet. But alright. I'll take it. Excuse me, guys. Um, so here we are, we are done. We, we've just gotten through the funeral, just like gone down for a rest. Um, already got so, some, uh, some interesting stuff going on here. First things first, we've got the mayor who might have been part of a attempted coup. Um... I don't, I, I don't exactly trust our son cleric, um, order head. I definitely think Tomlin's been sleeping around for a long time. Um, Roy's like the only person I like so far. And, and it's, I, I feel like there's something going on there. Like he's like cursed or some shit. I don't fucking know. But the sneezing, that reminds me too much of some old school bullshit to make it so that it, um, spellcasters can't use somatic components properly. Um, so, right out the gate, um, Craigans made it through the first day perfectly fine, intact, unharmed. So, we're doing pretty good. Oh. 
we uh, managed to technically pull two inspiration, even though we uh, can't stack inspiration like that. Um, and th with that particular inspiration. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely enjoying this. I think this is a amazing amount of fun right now. Um, I'm just taking a couple of hits off my vape here, getting uh, refueled, reamped, getting ready to go in for our second day here, you know. Really taking it in, mulling things over um, that, we've, that we've been in from the information we've been given um i got a couple of different ideas a couple of different working theories in my head of what could be going on here um but that's with not a lot of knowledge about what's going on now i will tell y'all this is definitely going a different way than my other playthrough of this um, I rolled the dice because I've done this before, but I've looked in through the window. I didn't go right in, just like all willy-nilly, like, all right, let's go into the fucking... Me oh, fuck. Okay. Didn't do that the first time I did this. So, that, that was a very different first day in Langston than my last time doing it. Um... Getting back into the Craig mentality. I'm hoping to see some combat today. I'm not gonna lie, okay? I wanna go fight something. I really do. We got the PvP uh, Tataki Jojo on the server up and running, and I got my feet a little wet. Reminded myself of how uh, PvP works, and uh, also reminded everybody of who the strategist is. <laughs> I believe the appropriate response is, um, come at me, bros. <coughs> but anyway, let's go ahead and get back to this. We're going to go for about another hour. Uh, we're going to go for about another hour and see how far we can get. Maybe we'll see some combat. Maybe we won't. But let's get in there. You wake up in a soft bed to a hot breakfast cooling outside your door. This is much better living than camping by the road, so it's probably time to meet your benefactor. The inn's common room is a bustle of activity as quiet townspeople load flowers from the funeral into a wagon in front of the inn. The body of the deceased is already gone. After weaving your way through the workers, you find yourself outside where passerby are deliberately ignoring the wagon full of blossoms. With the help of a few locals on the street, you make your way to the town hall. The town hall is a multi-story building, but not much larger than the surrounding structures. It was, isn't made of the same timber walls as the rest of the town, and is instead a much sturdier stone structure, so it likely predates the town's growth. The door stands open, and an aide greets you when you arrive. He shows you to the mayor, uh, to the mayor, in a large but simply appointed office in the back of the building. The room is dominated by a large, dark-stained wood desk, where Mayor Anathrum is working with a quill and ink pot. There is also an unlit hearth on one wall, and a couple of orderly bookshelves. There are no personal effects that you can see. A cushion and a bowl of water are set up next to the desk. The mayor's mastiff is lounging there, watching you intently as you enter. Um, okay. We can either go ahead and just directly greet the mayor, or we can pet the dog first. I'm going to go with, uh, Zabobby. 
Ain't that right? We go as the puppy, huh? Yeah, boy. So we are going to go to prompt 35. The dog growls, moving its considerable cheeks out of the way to bare its teeth. The mayor recommends that if you like your hand attached, you would be wise to remove it from her dog's reach. You believe her and the dog, so you pull your hand back intact. Better late than never, you greet the mayor. Go to prompt 21. Alright, you politely greet the mayor and the dog lays its massive head back down on its paws. It continues to watch you closely, however. I am grateful f I am grateful for your service, she says. You assume she is being genuine, but it's impossible to tell for sure with her stony delivery. She outlines the problem she's having, a gruesome murder about a week ago. The town militia is fine against bandits and sh or sheep rustlers, but this requires someone different. The poor girl was mangled as if by a wild beast. And she was found within town. Besides, Roy keeps the woods free of monsters and supernatural hazards. And besides, she explains, you're an outsider and therefore expendable. It's the mayor's role to protect the town, not every drifter that wanders in. The town will pay 320 gold pieces to eliminate the threat. That fee is not negotiable, and Mayor Anthrum gives you the impression it would be bad for your health to try. Okay, so we can technically reject the job. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the details here, and we'll assess if this is actually a fair wage for the service being rendered. We are being charged with finding Maybelline's killer and, br and eliminating them. Um... In exchange for that, putting ourselves at risk, essentially putting ourselves at risk and into the exact same dam uh, danger that has already killed one person, the town's willing to offer us 320 gold to risk our lives. To be clear, that seems extremely heavy handed. Um, and the main reason I say that is because. Low level adventure, number one. Um, number two, a hunt quest like that would typically be like maybe 20 to 50 gold. I could see maybe 100, 150 since it has already claimed one victim. But having the price all the way up to 320 feels excessive. It makes me think that whatever we're going to be up against is going to be pretty challenging. So. See, I wish we could actually do a perception or an insight check here first to, to get more information. That makes sense. Um, but we are going to accept the job, obviously. Forty-eight. So on to prompt forty-eight. Excellent, Mayor Anathrum says in a gravelly tone. You can only assume means she's pleased. Let us begin. Yes, please speak to Maybelline's fiance. 
He is an herbalist who lives on the western edge of town, where he tends his garden and makes medicines for the town folk. You thank the mayor and prepare to leave, but she holds up a hand. We also made an arrangement with our general store. You may go to resupply any time you may need to do so. It does not have as many goods as a big city, but it will likely have whatever you need. Much at a discount. And here is an advance to make whatever purchases you may need. And we have been given 20 gold. From Mayor Anathurum. You thank the mayor for her kind gesture, and she grunts in response before returning to the paperwork on the table. Go to see Tomlin, the town's herbalist, and Maybelline's fiance. Prompt 49. The General Storm. Anytime you're within the town of Langston, you may visit the store to visit the General Storm. Make note of your starting section and turn to the back of the book to the section labeled General Store. There you can follow prompts to make transactions. Return to the section you started from when you are done. Cool. Interesting, ain't it? Whew. This morning, Langston seems to be back to normal. Townspeople bustle about their daily lives of working, shopping, eating, and gossiping. You guess uh, there are around a thousand people in Langston, but you see very few people idle. Tradespeople ply their trades smithing, weaving, building furniture, or baking bread. But laughter is just a little too spaced out. The sounds of hammers and hoofbeats seem just a little too loud. The air is charged with fear and grief, even in the light of day. You pass the wagon laden with flowers from the funeral once again, looking forlorn al alone in the street. So you now find yourself in a strange town with a substantial payday on the other end of a murder investigation. The victim is a young woman who was apparently torn apart by a wild beast, but within the confines of the town. Your first lead is the dead woman's fiancé, but that's it. Looks like you have your work cut out for you. Hey, adventure! Calls out a man's voice behind you. It's the same man that challenged you to a fight the night before, carrying a bundle of barrel staves. We've got our eye on you! Don't you think we don't? A few others nearby shake their heads, and one local shoots you an embarrassed look. Yes, you will definitely have your work cut out for you. If you're able to detect magic through a spell or ability, go to 91. If not, we're going to prompt 84. Obviously, we're a monk. We don't have the ability to sense magic. And this is actually chapter two, guys. So we have already gotten through the first chapter. But anyways, prompt 84. You follow the mayor's instructions to Tomlin's cottage on the edge of town. But you'd have recognized it regardless. The home is a single-story, multi-room building with the same timber-framed walls. A clean coat of whitewash and a good-conditioned clay tiles on the roof. However, each visible window is nearly obscured by lush flower boxes bursting with color. The entire front of the home is festooned with decorative flowers sprouting from bushes and vines. And extending off to either side are more vine-covered trellises, indicating a substantial garden out back, some of which you can see between plants in the trellis. 
It's a beautiful space whose owner obviously takes great pride in maintaining, and you admire the effort that went into it, if nothing else. As you're not sure if the herbalist Tomlin is expecting you, you can either knock at the door right away, or take in more of the surroundings to see if there's anything interesting. Uh... What to do, what to do, bust the door down or keep looking around outside, see if we know, can find anything else going on. Fuck it. We gotta go ahead and look around, y'all. Gonna go to Prop 77. You take a moment to admire the lush flowers and plants around you. A brightly colored butterfly flutters past on its way to some purple gro uh, growing by the door, and bees hum contentedly among some brightly colored blooms nearby. It smells sweet and green in a way that you could lose yourself in the moment. But before you can decide to give up a life of adventure for a plot of land, the door opens with a loud click. You jump instinctively reaching for a way to defend yourself before you realize that it's just Tomlin and someone else. He is locked in a long kiss with a young woman, but sees you out of the corner of his eye and abruptly pulls away. She nearly falls with a cry before catching herself against the doorframe. Tomlin stammers a moment before reaching into the house and handing the woman a sachet of some herbal tea. Here's the uh, medicine for your sick grandmother. If there's uh, anything else. The woman has now noticed you as well and blushes. No, no, thank you. I'll give this to my aunt. I mean, my grandmother. She grips the sachet tightly in her fingers and excuses herself. Tomlin offers you a sheepish smile and a half shrug. You can chastise the herbalists, ask him who his guest was, or say nothing at all. All right, so let's let's be honest about this. This is Kragen. Kragen don't give a fuck about him being a hobo, or him being a hobo, you know, a hobro. You know what I mean? Um, not really too concerned about who that guest was we're gonna go to prompt 95 and say nothing at all Gain an inspiration. God damn it. Third inspiration. You stay stony faced and silent. The awkward moment stretches between you two until it breaks. You must be here from the mayor. The herbalist finally says. Come in. I'm sure you have questions. He steps into his cottage, holding the door open for you. Go to Prop 69. I bet that's what he was just doing. I mean, what? Yonsei ain't even cold in the ground yet. Looking embarrassed, but not able to resist glancing after his guest, Tomlin closes the door behind you. The herbalist co cottage is a riotous sensory experience. Fresh flowers sit in vases and lie in bunches on various surfaces. More flowers, herbs, and roots hang from special drying racks among the ceiling beams. 
The windows are all hung with vibrant purple flowers in the early stages of drying out. They are evenly spaced with small bunches of daisies tied with little purple ribbons, so it's difficult for you to tell if they are medicinal or decorative, but it looks like a bit of Maybelline's influence on the space. The odors come in waves, some medicinal and astringent, others floral, herbal, and fruity in waves. It's intense, but not unpleasant. The hearth's coals are banked low, but some de uh, decoction bubbles away in a cauldron. A more sophisticated filtering system rests on a workbench, slowly dripping a bright orange liquid into a vial. Woo! Tomlin reaches for a kettle, just starting to bang away over a burner. Clearly, he has started the water for tea with the expectation of a different companion. He selects a packet of herbs and wildflowers almost without looking and tosses them into a teapot and douses the tea in boiling water from the kettle. He pours two cups and hands one to you. Bitter steam wafts up from the yellowish liquid in your cup. He eagerly watches you to see if you like the tea. You may drink the tea. Politely refuse the tea, or assess the tea for safety. Hmm. Do we trust the herbalist? That's the real question that's being asked here. You realize that, guys. Do we trust the herbalist? Because if we trust the herbalist, we could just drink the tea. But if we don't trust the herbalist, we need to assess the tea for safety or just politely refuse. Or uh, politely refusing may be the appropriate thing to do in this social setting. So we could just do that. But then that might also be seen as an insult as he has offered us tea and gone through the trouble of making it for us. Therefore... We're going to go to Prop 54 and, ch uh, and assess the T for safety. You don't immediately recognize the T's ingredients based on its appearance or smell. How do you assess the T's safety? Mmm. Craigan's not exactly designed for this kind of bullshit. Um. Yeah, we're going to do a medicine check. So we're going to go to prompt 90. And we're going to roll a medicine check. That is a 12. Did we pass? <sighs> the herbalist is doing a poor job of hiding his amusement as you carefully examine the tea. I need a 15. That is a 12. We will burn that inspiration to get that 22. Yar har har, going to prompt 76. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how you pirate a fucking roll. Prompt 76. You identify some of the medicinal herbs in the tea and determine it's not just safe, but probably an excellent decoction for your health. The purple flowers hanging in the windows are a bit concerning as they are wolfsbane, a dangerous nightshade normally, but a potent medicine in the right hands. Uh, fuck it, we're drinking it. 103. Here we go, y'all. It 
It's an invigorating blend unlike anything you've ever tried before. Despite the bitter aroma, the decoction itself is earthy and a little sweet. Gain the benefits of a short rest, yeah! You let Tomlin know that the tea is really very good. Thank you. It's an old family recipe used to give us stamina. It's best to drink it when the mix is fresh. So I didn't see any point in wasting it just because you paid a visit. You look over and it seems he's finally overcome his embarrassment and eyeing you with a sly smile. You look at the cup for a moment. Oh no, just stamina. Nothing mood enhancing. So, shall we get started? You agree to begin as you set aside your empty teacup. Go to prompt 80. So, I guess you're here to ask me about Maybelline. Tomlin asks. You let him know he's correct. The herbalist sighs and sips at his tea. Pain springs onto his handsome features, and he looks past you into the middle distance. Maybelline and I have known each other forever, of course. She was the queen of the marketplace, and has been since she was a child, I'm told. Even when running her family's vegetable cart, she kept everyone organized and mediated conflicts. I'm the town's primary medicinal authority, for the mundane medicine at least. Roy and Selene help when divine intervention becomes necessary. But still, I know everybody anyway. Slow, sad smile spreads across his face. And then, sometime around three months ago, something just clicked. We danced at the tavern to a baldry song, kissed in the moonlight, planned to wed within the month. We were just perfect for each other. And then the tears start. I'm sorry. Thank you for being here to help find whoever or whatever did this so that no one else would have to feel this kind of pain. It's no wonder her parents are holding themselves up in the farm, refusing to talk to anyone. Maybelline was a bright and shining star. We'll be missed dearly. What else you want to know? I... I okay, okay. I gotta give the... Give... Give obvious mimic some respect here for a second that is so on point with tabletops deep emotional moment what else you want to know fuck you all right so we can ask tomlin uh we can ask where tomlin was the night maybelline died ask if maybelline had any enemies ask tomlin if he's seen anyone or anything strange around town lately I kind of want to know where our boy was at. We're going to go to Prompt 101 first. When you ask Tomlin where he was on the night of Maybelline's death, a dark flash of anger crosses his face. However, his expression quickly dissolves into shame. I was with friends, he says. Oh no, not that kind of friend. I was having a drink at the tavern and it got a little out of hand. Maybelline and I had a whirlwind courtship, so there was no stag party. That night became it. When you ask if anyone else can confirm that, he rattles off a bunch of names. He has a dozen or more people from around town who can confirm he was there until dawn. Roll either an intelligence or wisdom check. So it's an investigate. So I can roll either an investigation or an insight check. So, we're going to go with 
Insight. A fucking 18 and on Insight. Very nice. So, if you roll 10 or more on Insight, go to Prompt 60. Gain inspiration. Nice. We got our inspiration back. Tomlin isn't lying, but he's leaving something out. You decide to dig deeper. Ask if it really was just the menfolk or why Maybelline wasn't with him. I'm going to ask him straight up if it was just the menfolk. Lying sack of shit. I think he got caught by all them women he be playing with, and they got angry. I really does. Well, mostly just the men. At some point, Selene was passing through on her way to speak to someone. She looked a little haggard, but was her usual cheery self. She stopped over for a quick hello before rushing on her way. You ask how familiar Tomlin is with Selene and her usual self. Well, you know. He shrugs, but more to relieve himself of some strong emotion than uncertainty. We were lovers before her pilgrimage, but while she was gone, Maybelline and I fell in love. You ask how Selene took it. Not well at first, but she came around. She even agreed to perform the wedding ceremony. You ask if it's typical for Selene to perform ceremonies like that. Her uh, Roy, he pours himself another cup of tea. Roy was there with us, actually. He left early, though, when he started sneezing and coughing up a fit. All right, so you can still ask why Maybelline wasn't with him in the first place, or if you haven't done so yet, you can ask more about Maybelline, like if she had any enemies. Or if there has been anything suspicious about town. If you have no further questions, you can also take your leave and continue with the investigation elsewhere. Um, I want to know why he wasn't with her. So, prompt 104. <clears throat> Tomlin looks down into his teacup, swirling the yellow green liquid and watching the bits of leaves at the end spin. I had plans to meet people that night. A childhood friend is having some marital woes and needed a near to bin. But I would have loved to be with Maybelline too. She just is, was, superstitious. She didn't go out at night when the moon was full. Thought it was an evil omen. He looks up at you, eyes glistening with tears. Turns out she was right. The silence stretches out, only interrupted by the occasional bird song outside or a bubble bursting in the filtration system. I miss her so much, Tomlin finally says. Never thought I had it in me to settle down with just one woman. Especially not a farmer's daughter from the town where I've lived all my life. But that's what happened anyway. And despite my reputation. The herbalist's voice catches and he wipes a few tears from each eye before asking. Is there anything else you might need to know from him? Alright. So we can either go ask about Maybelline's enemies, any other strange things happening in town, or move on. Um, let's shift or let's let's try to shift this, and we're gonna go to prompt sixty-two. Ask about the town before asking. I just forgot what prompt I said. Sixty-two.
Tomlin rubs his beard, which he probably knows highlights his jawline. Nothing strange except maybe that the wolves have become more vocal than usual. There have always been wolves around, but they seem louder and closer over the last month or two. You ask if the wolves have ever been a threat before. Only to livestock, Tomlin says. But now that I think about it, there's also some talk of a couple of strangers that for some reason made a camp near Emmett and Tilly's bombstead. Why wouldn't someone stay in town? There are a lot of reasons, Tomlin says with a shrug. They haven't the coin, maybe. Or they're like Roy and just prefer to sleep without walls hemming you in. But there have also been some farmers complaining about thefts. If these, whoever they are, if they're up to no good, that could be why they aren't staying in town. Could they have done this? The herbalist's voice tightens as he makes the realization, and his eyes flash with anger. But you assure him that you will find out. All right, so we only got one place left to go, and that is Prompt 56. Did our girl have any enemies? Tomlin scoffs. Of course, she didn't have any enemies. Everyone loved her, and she loved everyone back. It's as simple as that. Obviously, even the best people aren't universally beloved, so Tomlin isn't telling you something. You try to get the information out of him by persuading him that it's safe to tell you. So I can roll a persuasion check. All right, you liar. A nat 20. That's the shit right there, yo. All right, if you get a 10 or more, go to problem 85. Prompt 85. Tomlin resists revealing any names at first, but only slightly. In fact, there are at least two people I can think of, he says. Then quickly raises his hands in a soothing motion. Now these aren't so much enemies as conflicts, you understand. You nod and he tells you what he knows. He'd seen Maybelline and Mayor Anathram arguing, and Maybelline never argued with anyone as far as he knew. Sadly, he couldn't hear what they were saying. And Selene was his lover before she went on a pilgrimage. He didn't wait for her, and his love for Maybelline blossomed while Selene was away. Obviously, losing me was quite the blow, Tomlin said with a crooked smile. But then he remembers himself and returns to the story without the playboy arrogance. Selene had shut herself up in the tower for a while before finally venturing out to administer her priestly duties. Mostly anointing babies, blessing homes, and similar tasks. Tomlin didn't speak to her much at that time. Does that help at all? Tomlin asks. All right. So now we are going to 105. <laughs> so we've seen that number a lot. You say that Tomlin has been very helpful. That would probably be one of the few that that is probably the first thing I would adjust if I were them is um that 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 dead end loop that gets created by 85. Um that's about it so far. Tomlin clears his throat as you ready yourself to go. Before you move on, Adventure, there is something going on here that I'm worried is related to Maybelline's death. The past few nights, something has been tearing up the garden, destroying months of cultivation, and there are strange clawed prints in the soil many mornings. You ask what you could possibly do to help. Well, obviously I'm a lover, he says, 
Not a fighter. Please check the garden before you go. He seems genuinely earnest and fearful, so you feel as though you should check it out. Go to Prop 78. Are we about to get into a fight? Not gonna lie, Kragen's over here ready. Tomlin shows you to the garden outside the back of his cottage. The lush space is a riot of color and smells, but it's also well organized. It's more of a small farming plot than what can reasonably be called a garden. Flower beds and tracks of green herbs dominate the plot, while climbing vines cover trellises that make up a fence. One of the beams anchoring a far corner of the trellises has fallen over. The place smells amazing and bees lazily hum from blossom to blossom. From here you can examine the flower beds, 99. Take a look at the fallen post, 71. Or walk the trellis perimeter, 81. What to do? What to do? We're going to check the perimeter and go to prompt 81 first. If I'm going to get, if I'm going to end up in a fight, I at least want to have the advantage. You walk around the outer edge of the garden. There's a well-worn trail here and Tomlin seems to be moving almost mechanically. The trellis is hung with climbing vines of different varieties some sprouting flowers and others fruits or vegetables. The trellises use a, fair, a fairly tight lattice to form what's functionally a wall of vegetation around Tomlin's herb garden, offering both privacy and a sense of peace to the sizable plot of land Tomlin can call his own. It's a pleasant little stroll, in fact, but you can't help wondering how many times Tomlin and Maybelline might have walked this same circuit. Or with how many other women Tomlin may have done the same. The herbalist doesn't seem to notice the beauty, but instead is checking the health of his plants. Some of which appear to be worse for wear. Roll a wisdom perception check. If you get a 15 or more, go to 75. If you roll less than 15, go to 92. Perception. That is a 16. That was so close, too. All right, so we will be going to prompt 75. You notice two dead shrubs that appear out of place in this manicured garden. Despite being out of the wind, they start to shake and creak, so you know something is amiss. The shrubs uproot themselves and attack, which is about what you'd expect. Go to 64. Dun 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 It is battle motherfucking time. All right. The scraplings look like two small humanoids, apparently made of dry wood. They break at you with sharp claws amid the ch the clattering of their wooden limbs. Tomlin grabs a nearby pitchfork and engages one of them. He calls out, "Kill them!" With fire if you can! Fight the scraplings you have engaged. Both fight to the death. Well. <clears throat> Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen. We have arrived at our first fight. And we got two of these guys. All right, so can we find the bushes they came out of? Let's try Craig get onto this. Oh, oops. Token layer. Token layer. All right. So we walk in the perimeter these two bushes i'm gonna go with over here it's 
These look like this is where they were meant to be hiding at. You know what I mean? All right. So we got two of these. All right. So we will be rolling initiative. Turn order. Initiative. Uh, well, that happened. What are they called? Scraplings. Well, actually, we don't need to. They'll take their turn at the same time. So, we are going to go ahead, roll our d20. That is a 10 for them. Yeah, this is already looking bad for me. Whoop. Um, I might just use my inspiration to re-roll initiative. Nah, 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 nah. All right, so here we go. Um, I am caught unawares. So I was probably close, probably close like that to them realistically, but all right. Um, yeah, they're gonna be. They have claws. That's it. So Kragen's R A C is not. Correct. Should be my Dex and Wiz. Automatic. Custom. Dex. Plus Wisdom. It should be a 14. Yep. All right. So, first scrappling is going to rush me, is going to move in on me, and going to make that uh, to hit roll. A 10 does not hit. The other scrappling is going to move in, receive a flanking bonus, and swing at me. A 12. Oh, wait, one more. A 14 does, in fact, hit. And that will be, holy shit, four points of damage to Gregan. Very nice. All right. That is I don't know why it unprogrammed this. There we go. All right, and that is it for the scraplings. Now it is Kragen's move. Kragen's gonna do some dumb shit. Speed is currently a 40, so. One. No, wait, no, wait. One. Two, three, yeah, that should do it. Okay, so, 
Kragen is going to use, uh, is going to go ahead. Let me double check the exact wording here so I'm, so that, and show you guys. Charging expertise. You can rush into combat, ending your charge with a brutal attack. When you use the dash action on your turn, you can spend a bonus action to make a melee weapon attack or attempt to shove a creature. If you move at least 10 feet in a straight line during your dash action, you gain plus five bonus to damage on the melee on the attack made with your bonus action or push the target up to 10 feet away on the shove attempt made with your bonus action. If you move at least 10 feet in a straight line during your dash action, opportunity attacks made against you have disadvantage. So, what we are going to do here is we are going to burn our action for dash to double our speed up to 80. Come here, 10 feet. That gives the sapperling an attack of opportunity. It's going to swing at me. They're both going to swing at me um, with disadvantage. First one misses. Second one misses. Then Kragen is going to move into range here. Burn his bonus action. To make that melee attack with his unarmed. God damn it. <laughs> I'm going to use my inspiration <laughs> to adjust that to a 23 to hit. And we are going to do five more points of damage. So that is nine to the sapperling. The sapperling cracks <clears throat> under the blow and falls apart, defeated. That is it for, uh, no, sorry. Kragen is then going to move into position next to the other sapperling in order to lock it down. And that's its turn. Scrappling is going to, yeah, swing at my face. A seven is not high enough to hit me. Sorry, bro. That's going to be my move. And yeah, it's just going to be uh, an unarmed strike. Miss. Yeah, there really ain't shit I can do there just yet. Oh, I can make a, another attack with my... Uh, with my... Well, now I can't, actually. All right. Well, it's gonna be scrabbling. It's gonna try to hit me again. Now it's just a war of attrition between me and the scrabbling. Next, it's gonna be my turn. I'm gonna try to break its face open again. Yep, that's the end of it. That is literally the end of it, as Craig in nat 20s, um, and deals total of 7 damage. Breaking that scrappling under his palm. Alright. We have one, so we go to... Prompt 88.
As you deal the final blow to the scrabbling, Tomlin screams with a wild fury and stabs at his opponent until it, is, until it is splintered and broken. The rusty tines of the pitchfork are bent with the force of his blows. He brushes his hair out of his eyes and spits on the creatures, but his easy smile is back in place when he looks back up at you. Well, glad that's over with, he says brightly. Souvenir. He reaches down and plucks one of the severed arms with its claws still attached. He hands it to you. Add a scrappling claw to your inventory. All right. Page 28. I got to check something real quick. Huh. Okay. Listen, I know plants, but not plant creatures, he admits. So you should take that to go, uh, take that to go and speak to Roy Sunderhammer. That's the druid. Looking up into the sky, the day is drawing to a close. However, and you feel it's not a good idea to try and find the druid's grove in the dark, given what you've learned today. You decide to go to the inn for a good night's sleep and maybe recover from the challenges of the day so far. You start to say goodbye to Tomlin when he sh shushes you. Before you go, he says, please join me in the cottage. You follow him inside. Go to prompt 72. I am very grateful for your help. Tomlin says once you're in his cottage. This is to help with your investigation. It was meant to be a wedding gift for Maybelline, but I can no longer bear to have it here with me. But maybe it will be useful to you. He presents you with an ornate glass vial. The vial contains a filter of remembrance. Add filter of remembrance, 10 doses to your inventory. Let's see, do we have these items? Let's see. Nope, okay. Filter of remembrance. Ten doses. Added to your inventory. Am I a terrible person for feeling some relief? He asked. A smile briefly dancing across his lips. No, I suppose that would be natural. And we were together till death did us part. 
He gets far away, and uh, he gets a far away look in his eye as he stares past you. You bid him farewell, which he distractedly returns, and make your way back to the inn. Go to prompt 106. You make your way back to through town after a very eventful day. The occasional point of whispered conversation trails in your wake, but you are left to your own thoughts as you make your way back to the end. It's been an eventful day in the life of the traveling adventurer. You've been hired to flush out and eliminate an unknown killer by Mayor Anathrum and her terrifying pet. You have also met with the emotionally needy and possibly unstable fiancé of the victim. You then narrowly avoided becoming fertilizer in his garden at the hands of a pair of scrapplings. So you arrive back to the inn to get some rest after, as the sun is just setting, uh, starting to dip into the west. You take a hot meal upstairs with you where you eat and ready yourself for a long rest. If tomorrow is anything like today, you feel you will need all the rest you can get. Go to prompt 93. Gain the benefits of a short rest. You wake with moonlight streaming in the window. It's a beautiful, clear night, but you feel the back of your neck prickle. After walking to the window, you look across cobblestone streets to the roof of the neighboring building. A hunched, hairy shape is silhouetted against the night sky and lined with moonlight. Though its face is obscured in shadows, its eyes burn with a golden fire. Whatever it is extends a long, powerful arm in your direction and waits. The rooftop is across the street and angled slightly upward from your second story room. And I do believe that this is where we're going to call it. With the decision to be made. So, first things first, gain the benefit of a short rest, return to 20, and we are on prompt 93 now. But, that being said, um, yes, like I said at the beginning of all of this, this is gonna be, um, a regular thing now. Um, I'm currently literally waiting uh to be called about what day i will be starting my new job uh once i have that information i will be here at night at once more playing games with y'all like back in the old days of gold hall gaming um so look forward to that this is going to be a regular thing um if you guys like it if y'all enjoy it um just me showing y'all the absolute monster that i am at the one thing I'm good at in my life. <laughs> that being said, I'm Aaron. This has been Gold Hall Gaming Presents. Thank you guys for joining me, and I hope to see you all on the next one.